I think that many of us can relate to this story. You've, um, you've had a dream, right? You're hanging out, you're having a dream, and you're in it, right? I mean, you are really in it, and maybe there's a person that you're very familiar with, your, your, person, your partner's there, right? Maybe your spouse, your, and, and you're just, you're about to really let them have it. You are mad, you can't believe that they did this to you, you are so upset, and you're sitting there, and just about when you're really, maybe you got a hand on your hip, and you got, you got a finger going, and you're really about to let them have it, and then suddenly it's beep, 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 <laughs> right? Your alarm goes off and you wake up and your person is there in real life and they say, oh, good morning. And you're like, oh no, don't you good morning me, right? <laughs> because you just had this whole experience and, and it's not necessarily something that they've done, right? But you've had the experience. It's imprinted in your memory. Our brains are like this. We can create these false Memories And often the memories, they, they drive a narrative to which we're emotionally attached. And sometimes these emotional attachments, they can hold us back. And when stressed, we might just lock into the way that we feel. And then what happens is that memory becomes supportive of, of that experience, of that stress, of that memory. And it kind of reinforces it in our brain. And so, you know, uh, I've really learned how to change that narrative driving my emotions. I've, I've learned, you know, when my memory is reliable, when it's not, and how it serves me, even regardless of its accuracy. So today, I want to share stuff that I've learned along the way of improving brain performance. And as always, please apply what you can use and, and throw away the rest if it doesn't apply to you. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a neurologist or a therapist, but I do have firsthand experience overcoming trauma. And I'm not going to be getting into any of that today, but I've come to realize that the stories that I tell myself and others, they can either be the chains that hold me prisoner, or the keys that release me from the trauma that, it, that I hope to overcome. My name's Christina Aldan. I'm a brand strategy consultant based in Las Vegas. I sit on the board of directors for a tech nonprofit and a mental health uh, foundation as well. If you want to continue this uh, conversation, we're using hashtag lucky memory on, online. And um, I'm doing a, a deep dive, a hands-on workshop on Wednesday about this stuff. So if any of these techniques really resonate with you, we're going to get into it, we're going to practice, and we're going to have a lot of fun on Wednesday. So I hope you can join us. I like to encourage people to take notes. I don't know. You you know if these if my talk will be online later but I always encourage people to take handwritten notes because it helps you remember things it's that's your first tip right there I want to say thanks so much to DevOx and thanks so much to our sponsors today so what so our memories they hold the key to better conversation better communications, um, improving our emotional intelligence, um, having a more open-minded viewpoint, being open to the viewpoints of others, and it also helps us set healthy boundaries with people who may not be too keen on, on respecting those boundaries that we set, right? So the things that we're going to learn today are really going to help you both in your personal and also in your business life. And you can see that somebody like me as a, as a brand strategist, right, I'm always looking for meaningful ways to connect products and services with the exact right customers and, and end users, right? You can see how this stuff would be valuable for, for me when I'm creating marketing funnels, you know, with emotional triggers. So memory. Memory is a faculty by which the mind stores and remembers information. It's something remembered from the past. It's a recollection. And the memory is a process it's how we encode, store, and retrieve data from different kinds of stimuli, both internal stimuli and both exter and external stimuli. So this affects our cognition. That's how we think about things. And it also affects our behavior. That's, that's the action we take on things. And we're always taking in information. Our brains are always taking in new information, monitoring our environment, right? They work really hard to regulate our, our bodily functions, our emotions, our breathing, our heartbeat, blood sugar levels, all of these things. And, and these days what we know um, and what we call memory is really a, a group of, of memory 
subsystems and, and regions in our brain that work collectively um, to, to hold that, those data. So we have multiple memory systems and they're constantly processing data and they're able to function independently of each other and they're able to function together. So memories are really weird. <laughs> memories can be compressed. Our brain has this quality, who's done this lately? Oh yeah, you know, remember when we had dinner six months ago? No, Christina, that was a year and six months ago, <laughs> right? 2020 just wiped away so many of our memories. A lot of us are dealing with COVID fatigue, that COVID brain, right? Brain performance is a thing. We might be having troubles with different team members or even on our, on our own team. And so, you know, the emotions that, that drive that narrative really affect that, that quality in our brain. So our memory has the ability to compress memories if it's the same every day. So when the day is the same and you're locked down and you're in quarantine and you're seeing your kids every day and you're doing the same routine and it's the same thing over and over, this is also very helpful, you can imagine, for people who are coping with trauma, right? Prisoners who might be experiencing the same day over and over and over again. Because our brain wants to be efficient, it is always looking to be the most efficient it can. And if the day is the same over and over again, what's the point? Why do we need to remember it, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, we can forget or erase away um, or even completely heal from, from traumatic memories, but, you know, using these techniques, they really help me and I hope that they help you um, if, if any of these techniques are appropriate for, for your situation. So uh, what you could do is you could just focus on even one of these techniques for three months and then move to the next, right? Just focus on one. Move to the next. Take a look at these goals here. This is what we're gonna go through today. We're going to talk about the uh, types of memory systems. We're gonna talk about biological storage, you know, different places that our memories are stored. Improving daily performance, confidence. And so as an example of confidence, you can see how it'd be beneficial if you're at a job and you remember somebody's name, right? And so you're, introducing yourself to somebody and somebody witnesses you remembering their name, you're going to be, uh, appear more confident and that's going to be really helpful for you in, in that job performance and, and to be seen as somebody who's, who's more confident. And then emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and, and to handle interpersonal relationships judici judiciously and empathetically. So, you know, we're going to talk about how you can improve your emotional intelligence. And then conflict man man management. Conflict is inevitable, right? We're all going to experience conflict at one point in our life. And so we can use memories to, to set healthy boundaries, uh, especially people who might not uh, want to respect those, those boundaries. And so, you know, there are lots and lots of ways to deal with any, any kind of conflict. There's, there's one extreme over here and there's another extreme over there. Right? And I just try to kind of waver in the middle and, and stay in that gray area. And memories help us adapt and, and do that, that wavering. So, so we can consider as many different options as possible when we respond. Responsible people respond. We don't want to just go around reacting to everything. And this is really cool. There are actual people out there who consider this stuff a sport. Right? This guy, Ron White, he considers himself a brain athlete. Really cool guy. You can go to brainathlete.com. He's got lots of different techniques online. Uh. Dr. Harry Lorraine, he's really cool. He's written over 50 books about memory. Dude only had one year of high school when he started working professionally and performing. Um, there are a lot of fun uh, 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 podcast interviews and things out there I encourage you to listen to because he's, he's quite a character. He's like 95 years old now and he's still as sharp as you know when, when he started doing this stuff at age 18. And, you know, um, Barrick and Ebbinghaus, they, they conducted some research in 1984, and it shows that most of our forgetting, it happens around three or four years of age. Most of our forgetting, we start forgetting things around three and four years old, and that's when our, our memories start forming. That's when our memory systems and our subsystems begin forming. And we have two types of those. We have uh, declarative and non-declarative. So we have one memory subsystem for short-term memory, for example, right? That that's helps us do on-the-spot math, 
right then and there. We have different memory system for long-term algebraic formulas. Right? That's, that's for factual stuff. And in fact, memory consolidation, who's heard of memory consolidation before? Memory consolidation is something, especially problem solvers and engineers, they, re they really like that, right? Because it helps us improve our long-term memories. It strengthens the synaptic connections um, between neurons structurally and chemically. Um, and you know, it helps solidify in those, those long-term memories by using the uh, technique of memory consolidation. So declarative memory. It's your conscious memory. It is, you know, the memory that involves effort, intention, and we can use intentional techniques to develop um, our, our declarative memory. Mnemonics help strengthen our declarative memory. Repetition helps us, and this is how we can process information better. Biologically, the hippocampus and the frontal lobes are, are where we manage, our brain manages our declarative memory. And it's measured by explicit memory tests. So coding tests test our, our declarative memory. So check this out. We have three different subsystems right here. Our working memory. It's about two to 18 seconds long, and it's used for doing math in your head. Like I said, it's on the spot math, uh, any kind of immediate calculations. So dialing a phone number, uh, um, you know, it's, it's where we uh, are able to take old information and it kind of collides with, with new information. That's our working memory. It lasts for two to 18 seconds. And biologically, you know, uh, vasopressin is the neurotransmitter that allows us to take in that new information. Um, we have our episodic memory. That's our long-term memory system. And this is where specific events are stored. Our wedding day, all right? A graduation day. Specific episodic events. Uh, life events, special events in, in our episodic memory. And then we're going to talk about our semantic memory. Our semantic memory is also long-term memory, but this doesn't have a, a narrative attached to it. So it's where we st store general information, general knowledge. Two plus two equals four, right? The capital of Nevada is Carson City. And so that's a factual account. If I take a red ball and I throw it to the back of the room, right? Everybody can take a look at that and they can see, oh, did the, did the ball bounce? Yes. Did the ball go to the back of the room? Yes. That's semantic memory. However, if it whizzes by your head and you're a little bit like, Christina, what the fuck are you doing? It's throwing me a ball in my head, right? That's different. That's, that's not going to be your semantic memory because it's not a general, general fact and we're attaching a narrative to it. So it doesn't tell a dramatic story where, where it positions me as, as the narr narrator or the, the hero or the victim. Non-declarative memory. This is our unconscious memory. This one can get us into trouble. This is where our unconscious biases are stored. Yeah? And so using our non-declarative memory system, it requires no effort because it's implicit. It's, it's just there. And it's governed by different areas of, of the brain, of the memory system. So biologically, it's the cortical areas of our brain, the cerebellum, the basal ganglia, that, that govern the non-declarative memory system. It's imperative for forming new memories. So we can't form new memories without our non-declarative memory system. People who suffer from amnesia, they might have damage to their cerebellum, for example. Again, three subsystems here for our non-declarative. Priming. Priming is when we use different cues, different triggers to enhance a memory. Maybe a, a, a nice little old lady walks by and she's wearing perfume that reminds you of grandma. Oh, yeah. And so that's priming our memory because you've spent so much time with grandma before and you've smelled that, that perfume so many times before that it triggers. The cue has primed your memory. Um, and similarly, right, we might have an old boss who's a jerk, and somebody walks in who, the room and it kind of looks like your old boss and you might think that person's a jerk. You've never met this person before, never had a conversation with them before, but your memory has been primed to not like them because you just don't like their face. <laughs> conditioning is, a, is another uh, example. So a conditioning memory subsystem is uh, Pavlov's dog, right? Pavlov, he had a dog, he would ring the bell, Ring the bell and feed the dog. Dog would start salivating. Ring the bell and then feed the dog. The dog would start salivating. Eventually, all he had to do was what? Ring the bell. 
Right. And then the dog would start salivating even if he did not feed the dog. And so we can condition our brain. We can use tools like neurolinguistic programming, NLP. We can use tools like hypnosis to condition our brain. Um, different kinds of, of techniques like that for our, our conditioning of our non-declarative subsystem sub memory. Next is the motor procedural, and this, of course, is when we commit to a task to memory um, using physical repetition, right? Your golf swing. Tiger Woods was like born with a golf club in his hand, and so he, he just automatically, naturally. I, I live in Vegas. We have our Vegas Golden Knights. We love our hockey, and if you've ever seen a professional hockey player on ice, it's like these skates are attached to their feet. It's amazing to me. It's absolutely phenomenal because they've spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours doing it. It's just automatic. They don't even think it, about it, and the memory is inherent. So when these different memory systems are stimulated, right, they start encoding, storing, and retrieving data together. And sometimes they don't work together. Sometimes a memory system, it, it might be completely isolated and it might be inactive. Um, so let's say you're taking a math final. Some people are not good test takers. We've heard people say this before, right? So let's take it, say you're taking a math final and you're using your semantic memory system to recall the formula. Okay, cool, got that. That's where we store our general facts. But you might be missing the working memory system and this is a struggle for people with ADHD. Usually people with ADHD struggle with that two to 18 seconds, that short term memory. And so for you, you know, for some reason, it's just not engaged. Maybe you have an amygdala hijack. Maybe, maybe you're freaking out and you're about to have a panic attack, right? Um, and you just, your brain's like, nah, forget it. Mm -mm. You can't have access to that data right now. Never mind that memory subsystem. We're going to turn it off. And so you're not going to be able to comprehend how to take the math test, how to do the algebraic formula. You don't know how it works. You don't know what the answer is. And this is um, a real problem for people, like I said, with ADHD, people who have panic attacks, anxiety, people struggling with COVID brain right now. Who's, who's had some COVID brain moments where you have like brain fog and you're going, oh, just what, why can't I think of this right now, right? And on top of that, people might have, they have different senses. Maybe you're more of a visual learner and you need to experience a lecture. Maybe you're more of an auditory learner when it comes to math because everybody learns things differently in different ways. Maybe you're more of an associative learner and you're like, hey, you know what? I need my favorite hoodie because I always do math <laughs> with my favorite hoodie. And so the, the association of that, I study wearing my favorite hoodie. I always have to have my favorite hoodie whenever I'm, I'm learning math. And so, you know, the goal is to organize the information for your brain, to take in the data and to organize them for your specific brain. There's 7.8 billion different ways to train a brain. But brains lie. The reality is, is that brains lie, and the more rigid our beliefs are and the more distracted we are, the more our brains lie, unfortunately. And so why do our brains deceive us? Well, there are lots of ways, um, you know, during encoding, during storing, and also during retrieval that we can have interruptions, um, we, can, we have false memories, we're forgetful, we trust our eyes but not our ears. All of these different ways our brains can lie. So if you're struggling with, with connecting with with others, for example, and this is a real thing. I'm not talking about, oh man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in quarantine and I can't see my friends and I'm kind of bummed. I'm, I'm talking about people who feel a real serious disconnect from the world and, and they struggle to connect with other people. You might end up starting to ruminate on that a little bit, right? You might start to go back and look at the past and past scenes from that place of rumination. You might place yourself as a victim of your story, the narrative and the emotions that you attach to it might change. And then suddenly, you think back all these false memories where instead you place yourself as a victim of your story. And, and this is how we can get really depressed without professional help, right? This is how we can start ruminating. This, this is in extreme cases of trauma, your brain might even dissociate from the memories altogether. 
Sometimes how we remember things depends on their focus. This is something you might have done before. You go to a movie. I just saw the uh, recent James Bond movie. Let's say I, I go to the movie and, and I say, hey, I'm telling Jane, let's go to the movie. Awesome, Christina, we're going to the movie and we really enjoy it and it's really fun. And three weeks later, I run into Jane again and I go, oh, Jane, you have got to go see that movie. Girl, it is so good. Like there was a car and it was fast and I'm telling her all about it and you really need, and she goes, what are you talking about? I was there, I was there with you, I saw it. But that wasn't your focus. Your focus was on the movie. Your focus was on the experience of the movie and your brain just kind of filled in whatever friend spot, you know, <laughs> uh, John instead, whoever to, to that. And so it didn't even occur to you because your focus was not on who you went to it the movie with, but your focus was on the movie itself. Interruptions as well. Interruptions will help us uh, forget things. A distracted mind, especially in today's distracted world, will, you know, block our senses. If somebody comes in, we have to stop, pause, turn all of our senses and our attention to, from what we're on to the other thing. We can have retroactive and proactive interference. And so, you know, one communication tool for that that I use with my children all the time, I'm a consultant, so I work at home, is I do one of these. <laughs> Mom, can I? <laughs> Right? And so just help me finish up my one last thing. Give me 30 seconds. Give me one minute to finish the email. Give me five minutes to do the thing so I can finish and complete the thought so that all of the balls don't fall onto the floor and instead I can gently set them down in exactly the right sequence and place that they need to go and then I can turn my attention to where, where they are. All right, let's move forward. Check this out. What you see is not always what you get, right? What you see is not always what you get because eyewitness accounts are not the best evidence. And, you know, over again, this has been proven around the world, research and, and different laboratories all over show that we cannot always trust our memories because brains lie. So how do we improve our memory? It's possible to improve our memory. It's possible to improve our capacity for learning and our ability to encode, store, and retrieve data. And it's because of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is really awesome. This is a quality that we've learned about just in the last maybe 10 years about our brain. As we stimulate our brain, our nervous system, our, our neurons, a, a neural pathway over and over and over again, what happens is essentially we kind of deepen the group. If the stimulus is strong enough or repetitive enough, we are going to remember it. And that stimulates you know, the, the belief system associated with those memories, which brings in stimuli from our environmental um, experiences and, and from the people associated with those memories, right? And so that locks in. And so that long-term locking in of those memories, that's, that's called learning. Right? That's how we improve our brain performance. And so as we stimulate that uh, neural pathway, we strengthen the pathway. Um, and it makes sense then, of course, that, that just reading a book or, or trying out you know, one lecture on, on emotional intelligence or, or memories, it doesn't instantly make, make you an expert. You've got to practice this stuff over and over again. And you know, as, as your mindset changes, right, you shift, and, and then the community around you responds. So uh, here's something about neuroplasticity that's <laughs> really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's little Christina crawling around. In the US, we have 110 volts. Regardless, there's little baby Christina crawling around my grandma's house on the floor one day. And you know those, those metal hairpins, those, those metal bobby, they're, they're the perfect size for a 110 volt outlet. So there I am crawling around. I pick it up and stick it in there. <laughs> How many times in my life do you think that I have stimulated that neural pathway? <laughs> Once, one time, that's all it took because if the stimulus is strong enough or repetitive enough, we will remember, right? Also, just as we can remember, we can forget. And so my French teacher always used to say, if you don't use it, you lose it. And this is why I can only say, est-ce que tu un cravate? <laughs> Are you a tie? That's all I can say in French. It's, it's completely useless. I took three years, three years of French I studied, right? I haven't used it though. If you don't use it, you lose it. Remember, our brains are always trying to be as efficient as possible. And so just as we can reinforce those neural pathways, we can also dissolve them.
we can also dissolve them. In fact, as uh, babies are born, they have nice smooth brains. They have lots and lots of uh, gray matter and they get uh, more wrinkly and more wrinkly and as we grow older, because those neural pathways are going away, going away, our brain is trying to trim away, hey, we're not using this, we're not using this, okay, we're not using this, we don't need this anymore. If you're not stimulating the neural pathways, the memories will disappear. So, real quick, let's talk about how we process memories. Shallow, this is our, observe, uh, our observable um, physical reality, right? And then deep, very elaborate. This is when we add purpose, meaningfulness. We attach more emotions to how we process things. And that means extroverts, they're, they're going to you know, respond very well to stimuli that are assertive and very face-to-face -face and in-your-face, right? An introvert, that same exact stimulus is going to cause an introvert to kind of shrink away, like, oh man, why are you so aggressive? And they're gonna reject that data altogether. They're not going to be able to take it in, they're not gonna be able to learn in, in that way. So, you know, what ways can we communicate with our team members, considering that there are 7.8 billion different ways to process our memories? Well, Dev Nakima posted this on Twitter, and with her permission, I'm sharing it here that, you know, there's some tips for companies who want to engage with people who have different learning styles. First, front load the data. Make asynchronous collaboration possible, right? My brain's not always lit up and ready for input. Uh, for output, excuse me. Uh, allow me to communicate in text. Sometimes writing is better. Remember, people trust their eyes over their ears oftentimes. It just depends on what kind of a learner you are in that situation, in that setting. Real-time meetings are a lot to process at once, and I'm short on working memory. I'm probably bored, and it's taking everything I have just to stay focused and listen for understanding. So this is especially true during COVID times. Here, here Here's a, a recap of that. Front load the data, the, uh, provide reference materials, having asynchronous communication, visual, auditory, and you know, intuition. Not everyone incorporates the same processes to encode, store, and retrieve memories. So let's talk about how we encode memories. Number one, our focus, right? We can focus our attention on patterns of fear or fun or, you know, whatever makes us happy. And so we can train our brain to look for happy moments or we can train our brain to look for threatening moments. And here's the secret. Our brain is really, really awesome at looking for threats and we don't really have to do a whole lot to train our brain to look for threats, okay? But we do have to work to train our brain for those happy moments. And so, you know, for example, you might try to, uh, count how many times a day you see somebody having a happy moment, right? And every day, maybe count one more happier moment than the day before. And that's just a small little simple technique that you can tr start to train your brain to look for happy moments. And, you know, maybe you want to appreciate the sky, the colors around you, feel the warm sun on your face. Um, pause just to become aware of your environment and your focus. Let's all try this right now, slow and low. Oh, everybody take a deep breath in. <sighs> we can pause and that is a wonderful gift. We can give ourselves for free once a day, twice a day, several times a day. Not only does that help you at a Oh, I just need a little break for a moment. But it helps you physiologically, biologically. It helps us calm our nervous system, and it helps us train our nervous system even when some kind of stressful moment comes up to take a breath and just have those small, intentional, free of charge, little tiny gifts that you can give yourself all throughout these, the day, these, these, little, these little gifts. We have the power to change the narrative that we tell ourselves when we take the time to pause, examine our surroundings, and you know, we can create our own opportunities. We can create our own luck. So uh, here we go. Let's talk a little bit about improving our encoding. This is a neat technique. Um, this one is a little bit tough for me because I'm short on working memory. And if I push it too hard, you know, it might cause a, a little bit of a panic attack for me. But the, the card memory technique, and the card memory technique is a way to help encode data better. You can shuffle a deck of cards, and then you look at them, and you try to remember their order. 
52 deck of cards. I'm from Las Vegas, so we got a lot of card tricks. We got a lot of cards. Everybody loves cards in Vegas. It takes a while, but eventually you can remember the, the order of them. And just doing that will help you improve your encoding in other areas of your life as well. In other areas of your life. You can use cards to do that. I have a deck of cards uh, uh, here if, if anybody wants them. So, you know, you can also do things like um, play the memory card game. And you can try to remember where all the white cards were. You can lay out all the cards and, and you can pick out um, all, all the objects that are just with, with the black cards or the spade. And so you can play the memory card game. And, and that'll help train your brain to then, in other areas of your life, encode information faster. We can improve our encoding um, through action, because action boosts um, our episodic memory. That releases uh, noradrenaline hormone, and so we can use action. So for children who are wiggly, right, <laughs> if they're preparing for a test, if they're taking a test, if they're in that same environment, emotionally, physiologically, uh, when they take the test, they're going to do better on the test. If you have a wobbly kid like I do, you know, I suggest you let them wobble when they, when they take their test so they remember the information better. Another one that we can do is uh, the shoot the thumb technique. Shoot the thumb technique is really fun. I, okay, let's see. Uh, shoot the thumb, thumb technique is great because it has bilateral stimulation of our brain, right? And what you do is you shoot your thumb. But what you also do is you hold on to an idea, a memory, a thought as you're shooting your thumb and you hold on to that thought and you keep shooting your thumb and you follow your eyes to each thumb as you shoot it. And I, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I got it. Okay, no, yeah, can I talk? Yep, I can. All right, it's like one of those pat your belly in your head things, right? That helps you include, in, improve your encoding, and it helps you encode memory better. So, um, you know, your, your neural pathways will be transmitting um, bilateral data across both hemispheres of your brain, and so shoot the thumb is a neuromotor brain technique for, for improving your brain function. Um, uh, bilateral stimulation of both hemispheres, you know, it's going to use both your left and your right uh, sides of your brain. It's, it's really cool. The spacing effect, we've probably tried this before. Um, I use the spacing effect when I do any of my Ignite talks, when I, when I do PubConf talks, when I do five-minute lightning talks, things like that. I write it down, read it out loud. And so when I read it out loud, I'm actually seeing the words, I'm hearing it, I'm feeling my vocal cords vibrate. All of those things are stimulating different parts and different areas of my brain to really lock in those data. And so you repeat that again six to eight hours later, and then you repeat it again before bed, and then when you wake up, you know, again, that memory consolidation quality really helps you um, um, the, the next day to, to remember it. So uh, the spacing effect. Another, really thing, another good thing we can do is we can relax. We can relax. We could take a slow and low O. That neurotransmitter vasopressin is going to be le released when we're relaxed and only when we're relaxed. Otherwise, we got adrenaline, we got cortisol, and that is going to stimulate our amygdala. And our amygdala, as we learned earlier, can hijack your prefrontal cortex. That information, those data are not going to get up there to that executive functioning if you're really stressed out and you're just going to go around reacting, 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 right? Instead of being able to respond. And so with a relaxed mind, um, we're, we're less likely to have an amygdala hijack, right? So here's a review of uh, how we can improve our encoding, the memory card trick, physical action, shoot the thumb technique, the, the spacing effect, and, and just by being receptive. And now we're going to talk about how we store our memory. So everybody has a song. Everybody has a song. For me, I love the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. It takes me back. Way, uh, the jamming out, right? Instantly, it, it brings me there. Our senses, they help us remember things. And it helps us for storing those memories, and then retrieving them better e uh, later. And so we use all of these senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, time, sense of hunger, um, sense of blushing when, when we get flushed, a sense of agency, which is you know, a sense of ourselves. Um, in, in marketing, we say that a, a confused mind says no. And so if our prefrontal cortex gets five or more sensory inputs, in fact, 
it's going to be too much, right? So we don't want overload so much that it's going to cause us a panic attack, but we do want to incorporate different senses, and that's why I encourage people to take notes, handwritten notes, um, as opposed to typing or anything like that while, while you're trying to learn something. But remember, our brains, they lie. And so <laughs> it's really easy to trick our brain and manipulate the data to, to manipulate our senses. So we've got to incorporate multiple sensory inputs when, when storing information, just not too many. Because false memories, they're a thing, you know, and so we can put in safeguards into place to, to remember. So um, remember, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a counselor, not a therapist or anything. So if you have serious challenges with your memory or with your brain performance, you should definitely consult a professional, not not a speaker, <laughs> um, but you know, I've met with a lot of different startups as an example. Um, I've served on a judge for a lot of, as a judge for lots of competitions, gave away money, you know, um, served for our, our lieutenant governor's office for entrepreneurship. And so what happens is, you know, as, as small businesses and, and startups grow, their goals change, right? As business practices change, operations might change. They gain new employees, they let go of old employees, and then suddenly the ones that are still there, they suddenly start waxing nostalgic about how wonderful things used to be, right? Our brains make up these, these memories, you know, or maybe, maybe it's a manager that they used to complain about all the time, but now suddenly, gosh, that was their buddy, and they're so bummed that that manager went away, and he really made, every, made everything right. Because our brains can, can lie, and this, this false nostalgic memory is, is created. But humans love telling stories. That's one way that we can improve our memory storage. Humans love telling stories. I, I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan off of Lake Superior. My uncles, they love to fish. And let me tell you, every time they told that fishing story about that really awesome rainbow trout that they caught, it, it, somehow that, that fish just got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. But you know, the story got better and better and better every time because humans love telling stories. In fact, we're gonna uh, go through a really cool uh, exercise in my lab about how to set, set up storytelling and really set yourself up for success for, for brain performance. Um, but storytelling is a good way to store our memories. And so, you know, when you, when you find yourself hearing that inner narrative, those emotions that are attached to it, pause and think. Um, is this helpful? Is this adding joy to my life? Is this a story that is gonna help me uh, be more successful? Or is this a story that I'm, I'm just kind of ruminating? Is this a story where I've placed myself into victimhood? Is this a story where I'm just kind of making up a false nostalgic memory because I, I, I'm resisting change and it, and it doesn't really serve you anymore? Maybe you know, you've already processed on it and, and you can move forward now because it's already worked out and there's no need to, to dwell on the past. Our hippocampus is, is what stores and, and retains our data there. Remember, we have 18 seconds to allow the hippocampus to get in there and do its thing, right? Storing memories from our short term. So if we want memory to be processed permanently, we're going to have to activate our other memory systems. And we do that by bilateral stimulation. Shoot the thumb uh, helps with bilateral stimulation. We've done this before. Um, humans love chunking data. Humans remember things better when we chunk it. Who has ever tried to get a phone number from somebody? Oh, yeah, give me your phone number. Okay, great. And you get your paper and you get your pen and you're like, all right, okay, I'm ready. Go ahead with the number. And they go, all right, it's 170 Wait, no, it's your phone number. Give me your phone number. Yeah, okay, it's 170. 025, wait, what are we talking about right now? Just give it to me like a human being, right? Everybody knows how we chunk phone numbers. It's 1-702-555-1212. That's how we do it in the US. We have the seven with the area code and come on, just give it to me like, it's psychopaths. I don't know who these people are, but you know, it's even better if there's a cadence to it or a little sing song to it. My daughter's learning her multiplication uh, tables right now. And so we're, I taught her six times six is is 36, right? Because she couldn't remember what six times six is. If you add a cadence to it, if you add a little tone to it or a story, people are going to remember it better. Another thing you can do is you can meditate. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's related to decision making, and it's really hard to make decisions. 
It's really hard to respond in a responsible way if you're freaked out, right? It's really, really hard, and so you, you end up making rash decisions, unfortunately. But even if you've never meditated before, um, you know, just eight weeks of meditation can change the performance of, of people's brain. You can get a thickening in several regions of the brain that involve learning, memory, empathy, and regulating your emotions with just eight weeks of consistent meditation. Also, you should get in touch with your feelings. Emotions help us remember. An emotional response, you know, however negative or positive, <laughs> It's going to be enough to, to trigger those neurotransmitters that activates a part of our brain um, to tell your brain to, to store the information. And so if, if you have a, a visceral reaction to something like a can of worms, right? Or, ew, right? We don't even need to have the can of worms here to see it in order to have that experience. It's like, gross, worms, yucky, right? And taken to extreme, if you're too emotional, well, you know, you might find yourself empathizing too much with another person. You might feel weighed down by their heaviness because you don't have psychological boundaries in place that are healthy for you. Your psychological boundaries for yourself are not stable. If you have more points of stimuli, right, you have a greater chance of remembering. So another tip is to attach to the memory to something that you already know. If there's something in there that you already know and you attach it to something like you're already retaining, you know, taking your exams and your favorite hoodie, that emotional association of comfort, it's gonna help strengthen the connection. And another thing you can do is create chaos, be unpredictable, break those habits up that aren't serving you anymore. Sometimes we can imprint into our memory so much information that you're just on autopilot, yeah. And this is because it's how we've stored our, the information in, in our brain and we remember the thing. So um, uh, you, it might just end up becoming a habit. And if you can be a little bit more in, unpredictable, if you can take a different route, even if you walk through your office building differently, it's gonna help uh, remember things and improve storage in your brain. Also, 21 times in my business of marketing and branding, they always say somebody needs to see it 21 times before it sticks in our thick skull. So we have to have repetition over and over again. And um, you know, we can have this be a quality that's beneficial or it can also be a quality that's harmful if, if people are exposed, for example, to the same messaging over and over and over again, they're gonna start to believe that it's true. Better documentation. Better documentation in tech as well is going to help us understand why choices and decisions were made. Not just the what, but also the why, because it attaches the purpose, it attaches the meaningfulness to why we make those decisions, and also why we didn't, right? And that way, while you're trying to migrate it into a, a different code base later, a couple of years down the road, you understand why those decisions were made as well. Another technique for improving storage is to remember what you value, what your focus is on, and, and, and what you're uh, re focusing on is gonna help you remember. So committing to a consistent documentation process when, when you facilitate those meetings, right, it's gonna help you remember who um, had, had the idea and, and what, right? And that supports better communication as we saw from Dev Nakima, her suggestions as well earlier for asynchronous communications. Right? And so this is going to help you uh, understand why an idea inspired you, why you didn't adopt it right then at the time. The von Restorff effect is something that ta illustrates our focus. I worked in a hotel um, for a summer back in college, and there was a police officer who was staying with us for the summer. And we were having a conversation, and he said that he always pulled over red cars and gave them speeding tickets way more than any other vehicle because his eye was attuned. He said, I can see the, when the red cars are, are speeding immediately. And one of the other police uh, officers was like, oh no, I always focus on the white cars. I, they stand out more to me. And this was, you know, before uh, lasers and things like that. But 
Um, it's interesting, the von Restorff uh, effect tell us, tells us that anything that is unique, that stands out uniquely, we are going to remember better. So here's a recap of that for improving our, our memory storage. The last thing I want to go over is how we retrieve our memories, the ways that we retrieve our memories. So in 1983, Tolving said that it wasn't just a matter of availability, but an inability to retrieve the memories that are still stuck in our long-term memory, you know? So this is like when uh, you've got that actor's name on the tip of your tongue, it's that guy, you know, with the head and the two arms, was in that show, you, you know, right? Drives you crazy. So um, another example is like when you walk into your bedroom and you go, oh, what the heck did I come in here for, right? And you turn around and you kind of retrace your steps, yeah. And so uh, the, the things that you could do also is you could use the same method over and over again. You can commit to using the same method for remembering something. You can also manage your mindset. Your mood and other biases are gonna influence the information that you recall. If you're too angry, you're not gonna be able to pause and think, my mom, she'd get upset. We had four kids in our family. You, Chris, right, you know who you are. Like, get over here, right? <laughs> and, and so when, when you're upset, it, it's hard to, to pull that stuff up because your prefrontal cortex is, is not activated. Intentional recall, when we teach it to somebody else. Teaching things to somebody else helps us retrieve that memory and also helps us identify any gaps where we might need to improve our skill set, right? Flashcards, practice quizzes, things like that. Staying healthy, stress, discomfort, sleep, is absolutely related to memory. If we don't have proper sleep, we are not going to have a very good memory. Observing mindlessness, where in our lives are we on autopilot, right? Memories can be malleable, and so it's important to, to bring those observation skills to the table because there might be places in your life where you've just kind of become complacent and you're doing things over and over again and it might be time to sharpen up the foggy edges of your brain in some areas of your life, you know? And get really clear on the memories, um, the stories, the legacy that, that you want to leave behind. This is a review of how we can improve our, our retrieval for our memory. So as you go through the rest of the conference, you can benefit from the intentional recall technique and think about these questions. What are you remembering from the talks that you're seeing? Is there a pattern of things that you notice? Are you sticking with certain topics? Are you sticking with certain speakers? Why is that? Another question is to compare notes and foci, right? Look at somebody else and see what they emphasize, what they de-emphasize, what's important to them. This is gonna highlight what you found valuable versus what they found valuable. What type of surface processing did you do related to the conference, right? Superficial physical details that you might remember. What type of deep processing did you do during the conference? These are the meaningful, purposeful moments. What kind of distractions occurred? It's a pretty distracting environment with all of the people, the stimuli and the vendors and the booze and the so many different options and the delicious food and the breaks and it, it's a lot, right? And so you'd be wise to cut out as many distractions and interferences as possible so you can help remember, yourself remember the, the content from the conference. So memory can be a tricky thing, but you know, if nothing else, I'd like you to remember this, that you don't have to memorize all the things. This is the big secret, right? We all Google the things. I've been in marketing and advertising for 15 years. I've been using these programs and I still have to look up stuff on, at Photoshop, like the most simplest things or, or InDesign. And um, you know, having the ability to creatively think through a solution, that's, that's really where our strength lies because each of us puts our own unique creative way of approaching a solution into a client's problem, right? And it doesn't matter if you have to use the interwebs to, to look stuff up. And so having these, these coding tests that, that only test one memory subsystem, you know, during interviews, it's not really effective. It doesn't give us a clear picture. Uh, same goes for children. You know, I believe that instead of teaching children to just uh, uh, memorize things, rules, follow orders without questioning, we got to encourage them to play and to work in a way that fosters creative problem solving and efficiency, right? And um, as I stand in front of you today, I just want to uh, encourage everybody, if 
you're a job seeker, if you're doing interviews, if you're hiring, if you're a parent, right? And I even want to appeal to the little inner child in, in front of in all of us. How well we remember something is not what defines our intellect, right? It's how we apply that information that matters with healthy boundaries, with empathy, and with creativity. It's how we collaborate and we all grow together. And for one last question, I want to know, um, does anybody remember if I was wearing a sweater at the beginning of this talk? How about glasses or a scarf or any of, any of the things, right? <laughs> so I want to just encourage everybody to really think about your focus, think about what you're placing value on, and you know, grab a friend throughout the conference and really kind of reiterate what you learned because that's really going to lock in those, those memories. I do have some memory card games up here if anybody wants some. Um, and there's some free tools also on my website. So thank you very much.